Hi, it's John from Android Addicts, and welcome to this look back at the first ever Samsung Galaxy. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Samsung Galaxy S. To know how we arrived at the Galaxy S, we need to look back at where it all began. Samsung have been around since 1983, where they were formed as part of a trading company by Lee Byung-chul. Samsung is Korean for three stars, which was meant to represent the company being everlasting like stars in the sky. Samsung have been around in the mobile phone market since 1988, with their release of the SH100 in Korea, under the Samsung Electronics branch. This only sold around 2,000 units, but Samsung continued to develop and improve their handsets as the years went on. Their first Galaxy S phone running Android, however, was announced in March 2010 and released three months later in June. Cinema quality entertainment that goes wherever you do. The Samsung Galaxy S, that's the wonder of Samsung. The release of the Galaxy S brought with it court cases and legal action from Apple, who said Samsung had slavishly stolen their ideas. That was 10 years ago, and the battles are still ongoing, but let's not get into that now, let's look at what started it all. Welcome to the future. Welcome to the new Samsung Galaxy S. With the world's largest Super AMOLED screen. The power to perform at super fast speeds. The ability to discover a whole new world with Leia. It's our best Android powered phone ever. The Samsung Galaxy S. So, this is it. The box itself isn't too dissimilar to my S20 Ultra box here, but interestingly, no information on the bottom of the box. The Galaxy S has a slew of information, making it a feast for the eyes. The Super AMOLED pops straight out at you. Remember, this was a time where Super AMOLED was relatively new, and it was one of the huge selling points of the phone. Being AMOLED meant the touch sensor was built into the screen. Previously, phones required a separate touch layer of glass beneath them to pick up your touch input. This also meant the phone could be thinner and more compact compared to traditional smartphones. Here we see the phone supports tri-band 3G and quad-band 2 slash 2.5G. We can also see that some of the apps that were shown off during the Samsung Unpacked launch event are listed here ebook, social hub, and layer. Social hub was a place that brought together all of your social activities, emails, SMS, Twitter, etc., all in one place. This is the same idea that HTC also brought into their phones as I previously experienced on my HTC Desire. We can see the five megapixel autofocus camera with 720p HD video playback and recording. This was something very special as well because most phones at the time were recording at around 480p. One other thing to note here is the DivX logo on the side here. DivX was a hugely popular video codec which allowed for small file size HD quality videos. Last but not least we see the GPS with geotagging. The GPS came with AGPS or assisted GPS which offered a vast improvement in the time it took to lock onto satellites. Prior to AGPS you had to wait a minute or more to actually get a lock which allowed you to pinpoint your position. Of course nowadays we can use AGPS along with Wi-Fi networks to find our place on a map in the time it takes for the map to appear on the screen. Back in 2010 though, this was still exciting stuff. Anyway, here we have it. We have our colourful front sticker on the device, which I remember seeing something similar to on my Galaxy S3. So here we go. There we have it. Looking pretty nice there. Nice little cover over the screen. And here is the front of the phone with its 4 inch 480 by 800 pixel screen. Front facing VGA camera, menu button here on the left, home button in the middle, and back button on the right. Can I just take a moment for the good old menu button? I used it so often and I really missed it when it disappeared from Android. It was basically a quick and convenient way to get into the menu or settings of wherever you were. Here on the left hand side we have the volume rocker with a hole for a keychain. On the right hand side we just have the power button. The bottom we have the microphone. And on the top we have the 3.5mm headphone socket 
and a rather interesting slider to reveal the micro USB port. Back in the days, I remember phones having little rubber bungs to cover up their ports. This was mainly to stop dust and lint getting clogged up inside, but I don't think that was actually a very common problem. We can see, however, Samsung went slightly more stylish with a sliding plastic one. At the back of the phone, we see this texture style effect along with the With Google logo on the back. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, this was to show that the phone included Google Voice Search and Google Search. Below this, we have our Samsung logo, which Samsung still include on their latest phones. The only missing logo is the one on the front of the phone, which disappeared with the launch of the Galaxy S8. I must say this phone feels nice, really nice. It's smooth and ran in perfectly, so it just sits in the palm of your hand. Anyway, enough about the feel of it. Let's take the back off and have a look inside. Yes, children, in the old days, you could remove the back of your phone and get inside it. So here we have the removable 1500 mAh battery. This is still the original one that came with the phone back in November of 2010. And it still seems to hold charge quite well too. Here we have the mini SIM card. Mini SIMs were introduced in 1996 and were still going strong in 2010. You can see here it's actually protected by a little plastic cover, presumably to stop any dust that might get in from your pocket. Don't forget these phones aren't airtight or waterproof for that matter. And on the left we have the micro SD slot which supported up to 32GB. Bearing in mind this is the 8GB model, 32GB would have been a nice welcome addition. Right, let's pop it back together and boot it up. There was always something satisfying about snapping your case back together. Now also back in the old days you used to receive a manual with your phone, so instructions on how to use it, how to set it up and how to play around with the apps. Also bundled in the box was the Samsung travel adapter, this had an output of 5 volts and 0.7 amps and also included were the official Samsung earphones. So this model, as I've just said, is the 8GB version, which is running the Samsung Cortex-A8, which ran at 1GHz. The GPU is a PowerVR SGX540, which was quite capable at the time. And we're running Android 2.2 Froyo. Now Froyo was a huge leap ahead of Android 2.1 Eclair. It was five times faster thanks to the new Dalvik JIT compiler, which improved CPU performance. Better memory reclaiming, and also a brand new JavaScript engine. Froyo also supported Adobe Flash and Adobe Air, if you remember them. Hotspot tethering was now built into the operating system, no need to download any third party apps to do it. Micro SD card app installation support, which is funnily enough something we've now gone back on. This and other improvements really made Froyo a force to be reckoned with. And here we are, sweep glass to unlock. You'll notice a similar looking interface to current Android. We have our apps and widgets and up to seven screens here which we can scroll between. And yes, you can pinch out and get an overview of your pages and rearrange, delete or jump to a specific one. Not too shabby. Our notification panel is somewhat limited. We only have the following toggles and there's no press and hold to go into the settings for each one. This is where my favorite widget would come in handy, the power control widget. From here I can control most of my bits and pieces from a widget without requiring to pull down from the top of the screen. Later versions of this widget allowed the control of mobile data and other features too. Interestingly, just last week Apple announced something they're introducing into iOS for the first time. So let's swipe over to Today View and take a look at our new widgets. Now we like these new widgets so much, we wanted to make them even more accessible. So check this out. I'm just gonna tap and hold on the weather widget and I can drag it out of today view and onto my home screen. Widgets. Yes, Apple, this was done over 10 years ago. It's not that groundbreaking anymore. Anyway, let's go through what else was installed on the phone. We have Aldico, our ebook reader, as mentioned earlier on the back of the phone's box. I must say this does look suspiciously like Apple's iBooks at the time. Sadly, the service is no longer live, although Aldeco still have a more recent version in the Play Store. We have Samsung's AllShare, which allowed you to share content from your phone. So if you wanted to play a film from your network, you could do so with ease. Very nice little feature. Next up, we have Calculator.
We'll cover the camera later, so let's have a look at the clock. Still the same layout as modern phones, interestingly. Next up is daily briefing. Now this was one of the big talking points, the one-stop shop to start off your day. You could check the latest weather report, stock and financial news, and anything that was coming up on your schedule for that day. Again, I tried configuring these, but the servers they once spoke to are no longer active. Now we have the FM radio. This required the headset to be plugged in, obviously, to act as an aerial and it supports RDS, speakerphone and up to six favourites. The rear speaker's quite good quality sound to be honest. And now here's the answers to the quiz. Here's what the gallery app looked like. You can see they're really trying to show off the power of the phone with these fancy effects. Next up is internet. Froyo's browser was touted as being the fastest browser on any phone available at the time. So along with Adobe Flash support, it was really something to show off about. You could play Flash games, watch YouTube videos in the browser. Yes, they used to use the Flash player. And it really opened up a whole new world of interactive websites to your phone. The Flash player was installed via the Android market, which meant it could be kept up to date. It started off reasonably small but grew in size over the years, which meant older phones struggled with storage space after a while. With support for 8 windows, no incognito mode in those days I'm afraid guys, and saving passwords, blocking pop-ups and RSS feeds, it really was the all-in-one browser experience. You can see the performance here is still pretty good, the text looks nice and crisp on the screen, and you can zoom in and out with relative speed here. And one of the old tests that people used to do in the old days was the switch to horizontal or landscape view and see how long it took for the phone to re-render the page. And you can see here it's, it's pretty quick. Layer was an augmented reality app which was meant to be the future in terms of finding things or gathering information about your environment. You could walk around and get details in the coffee shop you're outside or the monument you're standing next to. I think the main reason augmented reality failed is because people are lazy. No one really wants to point their phone at a milk carton and see some random cows walking around a field. I'm pretty sure people don't want to stand and watch a trailer of the film they point outside a cinema whilst in the high street either. I can see how it could have its uses inside a museum perhaps, but outside in public, not so much. The Android Market, how I miss that name. Renamed to the Play Store in 2012, the Android Market was your one-stop place for the latest apps, games and wallpapers. Sadly it's no longer functional, but at the time it was a fun and exciting place to browse. When compared to the Play Store, which to me just feels like a complete mess, Android Market was organised and simple. Originally apps were restricted to just 25 megabytes each, so try and imagine if a developer was restricted to that nowadays. Memo was a little app which was quite self-explanatory. Again, this style is very similar to Apple's Notes application. You can change the colour of your memos and expand them, but that's about it really. Mini Diary was meant to be a graphically rich diary that one would keep on their phone. Maybe you'd be somewhere cool and wanted to keep a note about it along with a photo. You could do that all here. Music Player was a feature-packed music player with some funky ways of browsing your music. quite like this CD view that you can have here, viewing your albums. I will just point out this isn't my music, this was already on the phone when I received it, so this is the previous owner's uh, music taste here. Along with the gallery there are some old photos and videos in there which I've uh, contacted the seller about just to see if they want them back. You had a few options in the settings here for the equaliser, any effects you want on your sound and whether to have the visualization on or off. Here we can see we can pull down the notification panel and play and pause the music. 
Press reader no longer works. It just pops up saying the service will be available soon, which I imagine means that the servers are shut down. Ah, task manager, who doesn't remember the days of having 300 megabytes of RAM? The days where you would meticulously ensure you would exit apps properly, you'd get angry if a dev didn't give you the option to exit their app, and you'd spend a lot of time ending tasks in task manager. So this is Think Free Office. Now imagine being able to create a Word document on your phone. The thought of it now seems ridiculous, but 10 years ago it was still a great feature to have. You could finish your homework on the way to school maybe. Creating documents on your phone was nothing new in 2010, but it was still a popular feature to publicise. The DivX video player, nothing to write home about particularly, but as I said it was able to play videos encoded in DivX format, which as far as I'm concerned was probably mainly dodgy downloads you'd gotten from Napster or Emule. Voice Dialer introduced a basic form of voice control for doing simple tasks such as opening apps and dialing numbers. It doesn't work great for dialing but it seems to work reasonably well when requesting to open an application. Open Calendar. The app doesn't require internet access either so it's Voice Dialer 1 Bixby 0. Apart from looking cool I'm not sure why you'd actually want to use this to open an app. By the time you've loaded voice control, given it the command and waited for it to respond you may as well have just opened the app manually. Dial 12345. As you can see, giving it numbers to dial doesn't really work very well. Galaxy Apps, now known as the Galaxy Store, was the Samsung version of Android Market. Not every country has access to Google services, remember, so this was a necessary addition. It still loads and displays apps, but sadly it doesn't seem to be able to install any from here. Here we have voice recorder. This is a fancy looking voice recorder which displays a reel to reel tape recorder whilst recording. Okay, so it only runs at about one frame per second, but it's still cool looking 10 years ago. Not any options for voice quality here, but you do get to set it to record for up to 12 hours. Voice search does not work any longer. I would say that it's probably the APIs or something wrong with the certificate on the phone which won't communicate with Google anymore, so we can't test that out sadly. YouTube. This app is now completely dead, as I imagine it was using APIs which are long since gone. However, you can see here the basic layout of how the YouTube app used to look. Obviously when you loaded it up, those placeholders would load up with the relevant videos. It's funny how it didn't even list the latest videos from your favourite YouTubers, but I actually quite like the retro layout to it. Now if you had an Android phone 10 years ago, you will probably remember this game. This was one of the first sort of uh, free games that were available on the Android market at the time. And it really uh, was cutting edge. Okay, so it wasn't really, but it was good fun. Right, let's just compare the phones side by side here. So we have the 10 year old Galaxy S on the left and the brand new Galaxy S20 Ultra on the right. Now you can see the thickness wise there's not a huge amount in it to be honest. Because of that extra camera bump on the S20 Ultra it uh, does stick out quite a bit. You can see the footprint of the screen size there it's quite a lot smaller and okay the home button and other capacitive buttons have been removed but the functionality is still pretty much the same. And we even have the same dual clock widget still available. Although I must admit it actually looks nicer in Froyo than it does in Android 10. Okay so let's just compare the cameras here so the Galaxy S has its 5 megapixel camera and the S20 Ultra has a 48 megapixel sensor. It does have a 108 megapixel too but for normal photos you would just be using the 48 megapixel and let's just do a bit of a comparison to see what the quality is like. Okay, so to be fair, the Galaxy S has a really nice camera still. You can see here the quality is still really nice, very sharp, the colours are well reproduced and you don't have the Bokka effect that you do on the S20 Ultra, but I actually kind of like that. It's nice to have, you know, a more lifelike photo if you want one. 
I'd rather have the option to have the bop effect on or off. So you can have a look at the shooting modes here. And the different scene modes that you can select. These are the different resolutions you can choose from. And these are different shutter sounds. Okay, the camcorder, there was no touch to focus sadly, so you were stuck with a fixed focus. You could set the recording mode to be limited for MMS messages. Set the exposure, set the resolution. And again, adjust things like the white balance, set a timer, choose your quality, any effects you wanted. Adjust some of the colour options there. So what I'll do is I'll put some videos that I took outside a few weeks back and we'll just compare the quality of both cameras. Hi, it's John from Android Addicts, and today I'm comparing the video quality on the Galaxy S versus the Galaxy S20 Ultra. Now I've set the S20 Ultra to be 720p, just to try and match as best I can the quality that the Galaxy S can go up to. So hopefully this will give you an idea as to how far we've come. So you can really see, certainly on the screen of the phone itself, the colour differences is huge. So it's all very nice and saturated on the S20 Ultra, but from what I can tell on the Galaxy S, it's actually quite faded. Same again if we look up at the sky, it's nice and blue on the S20 Ultra, not so blue on the Galaxy S. So I'm going to take a few photos and we'll just compare the photo quality as well between the two phones and see how they get on. So last but not least, I'm gonna run a Antutu benchmark test to see how this gets on when compared to the S20 Ultra. 10 years of technological advancements should mean a slight jump in the score, I'd say. Let's see how it gets on. So you can see here from the results, the Galaxy S scored a total of 2,932 and the Galaxy S20 Ultra scored 486,363. So yeah, quite a bit of difference there. You can see on the score chart that the Galaxy S was the fourth best phone even after the Galaxy S2 had been released. So it was still holding up strong back in those days. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It's fun going back and taking a look at how things have come in terms of Android and how we use our phones in general. We obviously have more choice and more power, but the underlying uses remain largely unchanged. We play games, message and call people, take photos and watch videos, all of which we did 10 years ago in 2010. So please click the like button if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to my channel if you want more videos in the future, and I will see you in another 10 years with, well, possibly the Galaxy S30.